Well, it is true what Jared said. It is very, very true that God sees us on our journey. And he is there. And even people who don't know he's there, he's still there. And so that is a wonderful thing. Would you like me to move this down? Does that work? You okay? All right. Um, very interesting how Cardin has a part in all of this with me too. When I joined Memorial Press two years ago, I was contacting schools in Utah and Cardin was the first school that I visited. And they've picked up some of our curriculum and, and they are such a beautiful school. So that's been a delight. And then the connection. Yes, God does have a hand in our journey. And why are we surpri surprised about that? It's just as it should be. Now, Sailor, that was beautiful. That was everything that is true and good and beautiful. That's what we want. Isn't that what we want? Wonderful. Absolutely beautiful. Well, greetings from Memoria Press and from the great state of Arizona where we had a 100-year storm and a foot of snow where I live this year, and we didn't know what happened to us. But uh, thankfully, the sun has come out, the snow has melted, and so we're okay. Um, <clears throat> I am pleased to be here for this gathering tonight and just to see a beautiful thing begin to take shape in American Fork, this beautiful, beautiful work. This will be wonderful. Classical education is dear to my heart. I truly believe in it. I truly believe with Memoria Press, our motto is saving Western civilization one student at a time. Yes, that is the work we are called to. It is a mission. It truly is a mission. So let's talk about that. Shakespeare, Galileo, George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, Louisa May Alcott, Robert Louis Stevenson, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, Emily Dickinson. What do all of these people have in common? Each experienced a classical education. The great writers, the great thinkers, those who founded our country, those who explored the West, the men and women we have looked to for wisdom through the years. These were all educated classically as it was the only known form of education for 2,000 years. It wasn't until 100 to 150 years ago that progressive education began to invade. And we had enlightened people who suddenly told us that everything we had done for all of these years and our country had been established with these people and our, and our government had been set up with people that were educated classically, and we had these beautiful documents that were beautifully written, and suddenly the progressives told us, you must do something different. And unfortunately, our culture has followed that path. And so what are we doing? We are recovering real education. The great Augustine stated, he is eloquent who in order to teach can speak of small things in a subdued manner, and in order to please can think of moderate things in a temperate manner, and in order to persuade, can speak of great things in a grand manner. Tonight, I wish to speak of small things, moderate things, and grand things in the time that I have with you. Firstly, I want to say to you that, as C.S. Lewis would say, that any originality here is unintentional. I am unashamedly relying on the words of the great thinkers, doers, and creators. They who have influenced our world far more than we of this present world either realize or want to realize. You see, if we are wise, we will look to the past, both to learn for our present situation and to find ourselves transformed into what we ought to be. In recent years, there's been a resurgence of interest in classical education for various reasons, one of them being that we are an educationally needy society. Look around you. You will see and hear educators and parents bemoaning the present state of our schools. The loss of the ability to speak and write with any semblance of order. Where are the thinkers of our day, the Aristotles? Where are the George Washingtons of our day, the leaders? 
Where are the doers of our day, willing to step forward and make a difference, undeterred by public opinion and spurred on by the love of all that is right? Some, when hearing the word classical, picture a more traditional education than the present day progressive bent, and that is true, but there is far more to classical education than a simple return to the traditional style classroom. Still others, upon hearing of classical education, picture it as an elitist endeavor, designed only for those who are more intelligent or of the upper echelon of society. Let us be done with that interpretation right now. This beautiful education, the only known form of education for 2,000 years, is for all. For in classical education, we are pointed to all that is true and good and beautiful, and that is a worthy endeavor for all of humanity. So what is classical education, and why must we return to it? If we were to contrast classical education with progressive education, we could explain them both with two simple statements. Classical education teaches the student how to think and consequently what to do. Progressive education teaches the student what to think and how to do. Very utilitarian in its endeavors. These are two very different paths. We seek to produce students who show that, as Cicero states, eloquence has its fountainhead in the most secret things of wisdom. The classical teacher desires to fulfill Alcuin's goal of, and I love this, I love this, Statement by Alcuin in his writings, he said that as a teacher, uh, he, dis he dispensed the honey of the Holy Scriptures, the fruits of grammar, the old wine of the classics, and the dazzling splendor of the stars. That is a beautiful education. We seek to focus on all that is true and good and beautiful from God's perspective and thereby produce students who are unfit for the modern world. By doing this, we are focusing on what we become rather than sim simply laying out a plan of production. We are embracing a life purpose rather than simply applying for a job. In Dumbing Us Down, the Hidden Curriculum of Compulsory Education, John Gatto, who taught in public schools for 30 years and has written several books about it, he writes concerning his observance of the modern curriculum track and the directions given to teachers in the public schools. And he says, all of the lessons are prime training for permanent underclasses, people deprived forever of finding the center of their own special genius, with the understanding that school is a 12-year jail sentence where bad habits are the only curriculum truly learned. We do not want our schools to be a jail sentence. We do not want to teach our students what to think and indoctrinate them. We wish to teach them how to think, inculcating wisdom so that they will then know what to do, exhibit virtue. We wish to see the fruits of their education resulting in a moral value system that produces kind and good behaviors and strong and virtuous character. It is not about the good job or the most money, though we do not disdain either. But let it be the hidden heart of the man or woman, boy or girl, that is pure and lovely and results in good habits that flow from good hearts. If you wish to partake in an education that is rooted in technology and guided by embracing the latest gadget, you will not find it here. If you wish an education that is centered on producing the next millionaire, you will not find it here. But if you long for an education that is grounded in the wisdom of the ages, one that is full and deep and produces thinking individuals able to make a difference, to think creatively and wholly, then this is the education for you. As a lover of words, I often look at the present state of our emoji-driven world, and I struggle with it. And sometimes my sister sends me texts that are all emojis just because she wants to. I never use them. I never use them, ever, ever, anywhere. And I even use punctuation in text because it's important. Um, our beautiful English language has been reduced to the equivalent of cave drawings. Petroglyphs, you might say. And when someone sends me one, I remind them of that. 
I prefer to use words. Language is a wonderful thing, and we must guard against cutting out whole parts of it, as we have seen in the world of adjectives where the word awesome has replaced all others. The next time you begin to describe something, search your mind for another word. Splendid, a favorite of my father's. Magnificent, glorious. Banish awesome from your vocabulary, and you will be amazed at how the world will open to you. You will notice how people perk up as if awakened from a deep sleep upon hearing long forgotten adjectives. You will learn words when you work with classical education and you will love words because what have we been given to communicate with? Words. How did God create the world? He spoke it into existence. Words are very, very important. Neil Postman wrote in 1990, clearly looking ahead, a truth that stands today when he said, the computer cannot provide an organizing moral framework. It cannot tell us what questions we should be asking. Young people, think of this. It cannot provide a means of understanding why we are here, or why we fight each other, or why decency eludes us so often, especially when we need it the most. The computer is, in a sense, a magnificent toy that distracts us from facing what we most needed to confront, spiritual emptiness, knowledge of ourselves, usable conceptions of the past and future. Does one blame the computer for this? Of course not. It is, after all, only a machine. But it is presented to us with trumpet blaring as a technological messiah. And so all the brilliant young men and women create ingenious things for the computer to do, hoping that in this way we will become wiser and more decent and more noble. But I maintain that all of this is a monumental and dangerous waste of human talent and energy. Imagine what might be accomplished if this talent and energy were turned to philosophy, to theology, to the arts, to literature, or to education. One thing to note, and this is from me, not from Neil Postman. Now that you have had this point made to you, you are responsible for this knowledge and you will not forget it. When once our eyes have been opened to truth, the only way to turn from it will be by willful ignorance. Socrates told us the un unexamined life is not worth living. Micah the prophet told us, what does the Lord require of thee but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God? A classical education involves the study of the great books, those books that have been revered through the ages, that have stood the test of time, that have trained the minds that established our culture, rooted in Western civilization and the espousing of all that is truly lovely. We do not participate in what C.S. Lewis called chronological snobbery, the view that we are now enlightened and so all that is in the past is foolish and provincial. No, we embrace the past. We learn from it and we let it guide us. And how do we do this? What are the differences seen in a classical education that result in deeply educated thinkers and doers who can write and speak and are not afraid to stand out and make a difference? Well, we study the history of Western civilization, which is, encompasses three cultures, Athens, Rome, and Jerusalem. We study the Greeks because they were the original philosophers and poets, the thinkers. We study the Romans because they were the originators of great government, our own government being based on the Roman uh, culture that was set before us. They are practical and political. They are the doers. They were the doers. So we had the thinkers and we had the doers. And we study the Hebrews because from them we learn how God our creator deals spiritually with nations and individuals. We do not ignore American history by studying the history of the ancients. Indeed, by studying the history of Western civilization, we understand our own history more deeply. Classical schools often adopt a pedagogy of teaching which involves, some, involves something we call the trivium. Does anyone here know much about the trivium? Somewhat. 
Well, it was first made popular in 1947 when Dorothy Sayers, a British author, gave a speech in Oxford where she talked about the trivium. She, the name of the speech, and you can find it online, it was a talk called The Lost Tools of Learning, and she was um, decrying the state of education even in the mid-40s. John Dewey comes in in the 20s with his progressive education. Even in the late 1800s, there's this sort of enlightenment that wasn't really enlightening. It was sort of a thought of do whatever, every man do what's right in his own eyes and we'll all be very happy and enlightened. And we know that's not true. So John Dewey came in in the, in the 20s with his progressive education. And by the middle of the 40s, people were realizing something is going in a very bad way here. And then, of course, we know in the 60s, everything really did go in a bad way. And from there on, we've just, we've all been in a bad way. So uh, Dorothy Sayers gave this talk at Oxford, and it's entitled The Lost Tools of Learning. And in this talk, she introduced the understanding of the trivium, which really throughout history has been introduced, but she was the one who really put it into words. And so within classical education, in our classical schools, we often talk about the trivium, and those are the three stages of learning. So... The first stage is the grammar stage. And we say that is about grades K through five. This is when children are young and they recite very easily. They can memorize everything. Great, great swaths of scripture, poems. In our curriculum, they will recite every day. They will have a recitation time, memorizing things about our country. Um, you learn your multiplication tables in K through five. You. Um, just memorize, memorize, memorize. You are a concrete learner. That is how God has, has made us. We learn concrete things. But about um, in grades 6, 7, and 8, 10, 11, 12, suddenly <coughs> our children begin to ask questions. And it's okay. They're supposed to. Because they are entering the stage of logic. And this is when they begin to think analytically. Well, if this, then that, and why? And so we use that, we use that questioning to teach them. Now, Belmont Academy is a six through 12, so they are dealing with that logic stage and then with the rhetoric stage, which I will explain to you. So classical education actually does something in that logic stage where we teach the subject of logic. They are getting logic in math and science because math and science involve reasoning. But we actually have, have the subject logic and we teach it traditional logic one and two and then we go on into material logic and then in high school into Aristotle's rhetoric and so that is something that you will see in classical education actual classes in logic and then we get into the stage of rhetoric so we've had our concrete learner who has memorized all of this information we have our learner in the logic stage who is processing all of that and it's making sense and then 9 through 12, the crowning glory of a classical education. We now have our rhetoric stage where we, pro we produce the orators that know what they learned here, what they understood here, and now they are learning how to expound upon that and share that with others. And so that is the picture of what we are doing in the trivium within classical education. Do you want to raise thinking children? Do you ever find yourself in a situation where you just want to say to the person, think? You don't have to answer this, but I'm sure every one of you has, especially in a bureaucratic situation where you go into an office and they say, we can't do that. And you're thinking, I kind of think you could. But they just have a rule and they just can't change that. And so we've kind of lost that creative thinking bent. But in a classical school, with logic being taught as its own subject, we are developing that thinking bent. And then, of course, there's Latin. Do not cringe. Latin is wonderful. You speak Latin every day. It's really not a foreign language. <coughs> it is the root of our English language. It is not dead. But it is alive and well, and the key to the infamous critical thinking skills everyone wants to talk about. No, it can quite explain what thinking skills are, but the fad is to refer to them continually. If you are in any type of public education, I have asked myself why this particular phrase has become a byword of education, and I've come to the conclusion that it is simply a bureaucratic term. Something one, some, 
one says that gets you in the door and it means that you are part of the educational world, critical thinking skills. Oh, I will let them in. Because Latin is a language of stems and endings, endings telling us the tense of the word, one is always thinking and reasoning. This is great training in causing the mind to reason things out and encouraging focus. And I cannot go on to another topic without also stressing that the pulling apart of Latin as one learns verbs and nouns creates in a student quite naturally an attention to the detail of words. You will find your students as well as yourself noting words and becoming a lover of them. Students' reading is changed. Any of you who have ever watched a spelling bee will have heard one of the participants, at least, ask the root of the word. Is it from the Latin? Is it from the Greek? They are noting words instead of simply reading for completion. It is unavoidable. Yours will be the intentional readers, noting what they are reading and developing comprehension skills without even noticing it. And then I've talked about the, the stage of rhetoric, which is wonderful. Those are the years of learning how to present oneself clearly and intelligently, and I love Quintilian's thoughts on the orator when he says this, no man will ever be the consummate orator of whom we are in quest unless he has both the knowledge and the courage to speak in accordance with the promptings of honor. So we don't want people to just get up there and bloviate. We want to put the whole package together. We want to have knowledge and courage and honor. Having poured understanding and wisdom into our students throughout their former years, the rhetoric stage then allows them to polish their words. This results in a fully formed, deeply educated individual who is able to present him or herself well, to speak with the wisdom, with wisdom, and to do that which is virtuous. Would we not want that for all of our children? Would we not want children who stand firmly in today's world because they understand the glorious roots from whence they came, the exciting but grave responsibility they have been given? Can you imagine what would happen if every child was able to have a classical education? This talk is entitled, how classical Christian education prepares tomorrow's leaders, doers, and creators, and it surely does, but maybe not in the way you might think. There are not 10 steps as our present utilitarian mindset might wish. This is not an education accomplished in a short time. It is far into our present culture of instant gratification. We live in a world that rushes to present the next greatest mode of, ed of education, and above them all stands the tried and the true, the old and the good, the strong and the great, classical education. Bernard of Chartres referred to the ancients as those who lifted us with their wisdom when he said, we are like dwarfs on the shoulders of giants, so that we can see more than they, and things at a greater distance, not by virtue of any sharpness of sight on our part or any physical distinction, but because we are carried high and raised up by their giant size. G.K. Chesterton, whom I love and encourage you to read, stated, the true soldier fights not because he hates what is before him, but because he loves what is behind him. Parents, as you sit here tonight and you hear these words, Think down through the ages. Tradition is the framework we hang our lives upon. But where do these traditions come from? They come from the ages before, from the tried and the true, from the wise and the wonderful, from the memory of goodness and the embracing of greatness. This is what we see when we look to the past, when we read the old books and the great books, when we cease from mediocrity, and dare to embrace excellence, when we strive for mastery, when we turn from indifference. You have heard three words repeatedly as I have described classical education, truth, beauty, and goodness. There are those in our present world who would not consider these three words important. Believing we don't have time to focus on these ideas when there are jobs to be had, 
But I am telling you that unless we focus on these words, unless we learn from the past, unless we understand that there is one truth, that there is true beauty, and that goodness is still important for all of humanity, we will never be the doers, the thinkers, or the creators that are needed to carry on this civilization. Unless we are willing to educate students who are unfit for the modern world, we will continue to see the decline of our culture. I want to share this poem with you from Ella Wheeler Wilcox, not really a poet that I'm very familiar with, but I found this poem, and it is good. It says, now dear, it isn't the bold things, great deeds of valor and might that count the most in the summing up of life at the end of the day, but it is the doing of the old things, small acts that are just and right, and doing them over and over again, no matter what others say, in smiling at fate when you want to cry, and in keeping at work when you want to play. Dear, those are the things that count. And dear, it isn't the new way where the wonder seekers crowd that lead us into the land of content or help us to find our own, but it is in keeping to true ways, though the music is not so loud. And there may be many a shadowed spot where we journey along alone in flinging a prayer at the face of fear, and in changing into a song, a groan. Dear, these are the things that count. My dear, it isn't the loud part of creeds that are pleasing to God, not the chant of a prayer, the hum of a hymn, or a jubilant shout or song, but it is the beautiful, proud part of walking with feet, faith shod, and in loving, loving, loving through all, no matter how things go wrong, in trusting ever, Though dark the day, and in keeping your hope when the way seems long, dear, these are the things that count. It is time to raise our sights, to embrace hard work and excellence, to look to a higher calling, to cease from complacency and cynicism, to embrace a form of education that changes the inner man and whose effect is, is seen in the outer man, that produces the thinkers needed and equips them to be the doers and the creators we so desperately lack. I want to leave you with a scripture that describes what we seek to focus on when we embark upon classical education, and this actually is my scripture for my life. It is found in Philippians 4.8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, Whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things.